Okay. Okay. So. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. I was um, listing mentally all the different concepts that you refer to, wondering if I'm actually going to refer to them in my talk. <laughs> um, if they're not mentioned explicitly, I hope that they will be there between the lines. Um, I didn't, I haven't used the word power anywhere, but um, I'm sure it's there. Um, so unlocking the intercultural expertise our students bring with them and that title connects with my memory of communicative language teaching green and kindling we should capitalize on the communicative abilities our students bring with them so it's sort of mirroring that and i'll refer to that as we go along this is an exploration um, thinking is always moving on, and it was quite hard for me to work out how to make the connections between EAP and intercultural communication, but we'll see how it goes. But I'm going to start off with a, a very, um, you can't see the, the sort of title of the slide, can you? Um, well, there it goes. I've got to move my mouse, mouse down. Um, so cultural difference starting with that as a concept. And I, I'm going to start off with a very sort of aggressive statement that in my opinion, there's no evidence whatsoever in my experience that abilities in attitudes to or expectations about academic writing have anything at all to do with national or civilizational culture. And I really mean that. If I hadn't read about it, I would never have imagined it. And um, I've taught students from all sorts of backgrounds. Issues are always there and they are multiple and the students' backgrounds are multiple. I don't believe at all that there's such a thing as the software of the mind in terms, the terms of Hofstetter uses. You know, we come from a particular culture and therefore this makes us think in a certain way. The evidence I'm using is that um, I've taught lots of British students and lots of so labeled international students. And I don't find that any find academic writing any more difficult than anybody else. I would say, though, that British students who only speak English have the disadvantage of not being aware so much that they can't rely on a language that is totally familiar to them. People with more than one language come with huge linguistic resources. Um, the other important point is I'm talking about students who are at the same level. And there's a slight sort of anxious relevance there. You know, what sort of students do universities take on? Do all the students at universities take on begin at the right sort of level? And that's all I'm going to say about that. I attended quite a number of years ago a seminar in which people were talking about academic writing. And there were a long line of international students who talked about their problems. And all of them connected them with their national cultures. And they saw their national cultures in opposition to the Western culture of writing. Nearly all the problems that they cited I've experienced with my British students. And I think what often happens is if people haven't taught that variety, they don't realize that so many of the problems that are attributed to being international are actually common. Academic writing is really hard for everybody. Absolutely. Okay. So competing definitions of culture. I think this is important to lay out. It's a dichotomy, which is problematic, but I'm going with a dichotomy because I think we have a clear choice to make about where we go in terms of one type of thinking or another. 
And that's what I've written about in a recent article and we based that on the sociology of Thomas Kuhn who talked about paradigm change and how you move from one paradigm to another and you must not go back. This is not a matter of choosing one or the other. It's a matter of choosing whether to continue or to go back. So the old essentialist view, which I think we're all very familiar with, you can see it very clearly there, separated defining cultures. There's a little picture up there, two cultures separate, and we're all struggling somehow in between them to make sense of how we move from one to the other. This comes from structural functionalist sociology, and it provides top-down explanations of how people behave, and it's crept into literature on writing. I mean, I think Kaplan wrote about this in the 1960s. And also, we get the image that intercultural learning is to do with moving from one culture to another, which I think is absolutely ridiculous, because I don't believe that these are separate things. There's a very powerful argument in applied linguistics, which says that there's a blurring of cultural identity because of globalization. I disagree with this entirely. Um, and some critical writers say that culture is a euphemism for race. So as soon as you say, or try to define anybody in terms of cultural characteristics, it's actually racist, because it's just like defining someone in terms of racist characteristics. Unfortunately, it's validated by the West as helping the so labeled collectivist other to be individualist and critical. And I think you actually find this at least in between the lines in university prospectuses attracting international students. You can come here and learn how to think individually and critically and so on and so forth. And that's been written about quite a lot by Vilanti and colleagues. So the new, but actually it's not new, because I think it's always been there. So it's like a recovery of something old. Kanagaraja and Keanu, who's a, a, a sociologist, write quite convincingly that this hybrid nature has always been the case. And hybrid, and, and Kanagaraja talks about his upbringing where five languages are spoken in his family alone. And there's a constant negotiation with small cultural groups everywhere. And it is not a matter of organized, separated blocks. And he says it's colonization that's trying to organize people into separate cultures. So my definition, I just made this up last week, and it goes with the diagram. Culture is a seamless extent of diverse practices, values and products, which we, within which we construct cultures for organizational identity or political purposes. So, and there was a, a, an interesting thing on, on television recently talking about the Celts in Britain. And, and somebody asked an archeologist, they said, could you, could you find cultural difference between the Celts living in the Southwest and the Celts living in the North. He said, well, actually, if you travel from village to village, you probably don't see any difference at all. But by the time you get to the far North, things will be different. So, it, you know, there's a continuation of, of variance, which is always there, but then it's divided into national boundaries, and all sorts of other boundaries that we use in order to identify ourselves. And that's real. It is real, but it's a construction, always a construction. And I think this is, this is very important. And, you know, I'm not going to um, demean anybody who needs to say, this is my culture for a purpose of preserving a particular identity. But it, it is a political construction. Okay. So, what can we use the word culture for? 
And I think it's really important to recover this creative, figurative sense. I, I was born and brought up in Leeds. I'm very proud of this. I, I really enjoy coming here. I enjoy listening to the accent, which I no longer have. I'm proud of the poets, the writers, the artists, the engineers, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Some of this is idealized, but I like the idealization. My uncle left school when he was 14, and now he's an automotive engineer, and he's very successful. To me, that's sort of Yorkshire, but actually it's not. <laughs> but I, I like this imagery, it's very important. And, you know, there's a, a, a wonderful painting from David Hockney of the York. When I see that painting, I just, you know, I, I'm completely overwhelmed. This is my culture, but it's all over the place. And most of the imagery is actually in my mind. And there's, there's Nadia Ali, sorry, Nadia Hussein, who won the, the, the baking contest. But well, actually, she doesn't come from Yorkshire, but she spent a lot of time living in Leeds. So I like to think that she comes from Yorkshire. So I identify with her. And, you know, I actually like this very cultural population in Leeds. Um, a colleague and I were thinking about very focal lenses. And they thought, why not talk about very focal, very cultural, instead of multicultural? So, it, you know, it's a seamless variation that continues. I think that the very cultural population, they are Yorkshire, but in their own terms. And that's the important thing. It's constructed and creative, it's not imposed. Okay. So natural hybridity everywhere. It isn't something that's in between those two blocks. It's absolutely everywhere. It's normal. And Homi Baba and Stuart Hall talk about this, others out of cells, escaping from these hierarchies that are imposed by colonialist structures, escaping from this fixity. And Stuart Hall says, replacing, I, I'm, I'm summarizing, replacing national identities for all of us. This is what we can all be. And if we are hybrid, we can always find something in ourselves to connect with other people because we are all many things. So I'm very keen also with Clifford Geertz's, um, somebody I read recently quoted Geertz to say exactly the opposite. I guess it depends which bits you read and so on. So he says, culture as an interworked system of construable signs is not a power to which you can causally attribute anything. It's an environment in which you can look around and see what's going on. So going back to that image up there, that blue line can also be what the researcher looks at. So the researcher carves out a part of this cultural enormity, it's constructed for the researcher. And what do you see? You see a lot of interaction. It's like looking down a microscope at a biological slide, except that in social research, the slide has, the, the, has not been cut off from the organism. The rest of the organism is still there. So wherever you look and you call it a culture, you'll see things that are going on that are to do with, with those boundaries just being temporary. Everything is flowing everywhere, all the time. You can't, you can't, you can't collect it permanently. It's impossible. Even if, you, even if you go to a shop in the high street and it's got a very particular corporate identity and everybody is wearing a uniform and all the products have a certain image and there are colors and so on and all the shop assistants are behaving in a particular way because of the corporate culture. As soon as they leave a shop and go home, they don't, they're different. We all have the ability to behave in different ways in different locations, depending on what's going on. Okay, and George Simmel, who I came across recently, 
um, says thinking as usual is always changing all the time, everywhere. There's no fixity. So, you know, this idea that you've got to learn how to behave in that culture over there. Well, when you actually get there, it could have changed because it's always changing. So it, it just doesn't make any sense to think in those terms. Okay, so what is intercultural? Um, well, I define that as well. Uh, whatever or wherever we encounter cultural practices and values that lead us to position or reposition ourselves. I went to a couple of restaurants in Brussels last week and I was horrified that I couldn't ask for a glass of water. They only sold water in plastic bottles. We had a revolution 15 years ago where we refused to always pay for water in restaurants. That was a cultural thing. Um, on Saturday, I won't explain why, I suddenly found myself in the middle of an of a amateur dramatics play reading. I'd never been in such a strange environment. In, I had no idea what was going on. I could work out the words and the sentences, but I got no idea what was going on. Totally alien, and I didn't know what to do. Going to primary school for the first time, visiting the family next door, where they, they behave differently, they eat differently, they've got different rules and so on and so forth. Having meals with my daughter and her family is incredibly problematic because there's such a, a political, talk about power, political regime in how these children have, this to me is real intercultural stuff. And then we've got all the stuff to do with, um, yeah, in, in universities, which of course is relevant to, to, I mean, I'm a sort of visitor in our education department and I'm horrified at how they're constantly praising students all the time. They never stop praising their students. This is a cultural difference. And why, when they have a mock viva, do they have to get other people to come along and do it? Why can't they do it themselves? I just don't understand. There are things that they do that I just don't understand. In the humanities, they only use PowerPoint to put images. They never use PowerPoint for text. They don't talk about books, they talk about monographs. They don't talk about data, they talk about sources, and you can't talk about methodology. So, you know, these are cultural differences, but they're constantly moving and changing. Okay, um, Lankshire and et al. talk about um, how as we go through life, we're constantly learning new discourses, and this is a constant cultural experience. Uh, Kana Garaja talks about translanguaging as political and identity negotiation. This is what he and his family members did with other languages in the community. English was always there. And they had to deal with that and they had to get it right. And there was a power issue there. My PhD student, um, Anna McDermott, recently wrote a, a thesis about multilingual families changing languages because of power and identity issues. And her, her, her examiner said, Do you think this works with monolinguals as well? She said, Yes, everybody is constantly changing languages, but we, we do it in terms of discourses. And of course, we have uh, Karen Rissio talking about lingua culture and how she brings her Danishness into English, which I think is a wonderful idea. So, um, Fred Durbin, interculturality is a messy finding of ourselves in others and others in ourselves. But messiness is the, is the key word there. It's very hard to work out what's going on. Okay, now. Small culture formation on the go. I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned it. I am, I am going to talk about it. The everyday location, every day, every single day location of where all of us, all the time, make sense of construct, contest, reject, or pass by transient new and existing cultural. It's not normative. This isn't like, this isn't like the sort of a community of practice idea. We have choice whether to join or obstruct or change or help to construct or walk away from any 
cultural experience, depending on the political nature of who we are and depending on, on, on power dynamics. Okay. And in doing this, we negotiate, this is Kanagarata's word again I'm using, this translanguaging, he says, it's all over the place, but you have to be precise. You've got to negotiate so that what you do works and is successful. And it takes time to work this out. Threads that bring us together and blocks that pull us apart. So I've got the threads and blocks from there as well. Okay. <laughs> now, my grammar of culture, I've been carting this around um, for a long time and I keep coming up with new versions of it. The basic categories are always there and I've color coded it. So red for traffic, I'm using the traffic light thing, nothing to do with political parties. So, so the red is, is the block, it gets in the way, the thread enables you to go and connect with people. So, and, and the word grammar actually comes from C. Wright Mills, who talks about the way that sociologists work out the framework of what they're looking at. So it doesn't come from linguistics. I read it when I was an undergraduate and it stuck with me, obviously. So right in the middle, we've got personal cultural trajectories. Quite a while ago, I interviewed a load of people from different backgrounds and um, I asked them about their cultural identity. What I found was really, really interesting, although the content was widely different, the sorts of things they talked about was very, very similar. Wherever they came from in the world, they talk about family histories, ancestors, moving from one place to another. And so it began to occur to me that actually what we do with culture is the same for all of us. The content is different, but the process is underlying. So we have journeys which are all very, very similar to each other, but the content of what we meet is quite different. And so we have an underlying cultural competence. Okay, now in the bigger world that we come from, we have cultural resources. And I think in terms of our students, particularly upbringing and education, all our students bring with them personal histories of things that they've done in their lives, in their education, which is of massive value. On the other side, everybody has experience of this wonderful, unbounded, creative sense of culture, which inspires all of us. And it helps us to work out who we are and where we go. That's up on, on the top right. Unfortunately, things get in the way. So the blocks, the us-them grand narratives of nation and civilization, we're constantly being fed. Us and them. My culture, your culture. It's everywhere. So this attacks. And every time somebody says, in my culture we do this, in my culture we don't do this, it's a block. The center structures, the way that, that institutions, structures and so on, make us want to behave, okay? but we take individual action. And um, Keanu really demolishes this idea of the collectivist non-Western culture. He says, it's a colonizing idea. Everybody, given the political space, takes personal action. This is the decolonized reality. We all take a personal action, if we possibly can. Okay, and of course, then it comes from the idea of um, utilizing this. This is refers back to the, 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 the language teaching thing again. Utilizing underlying communicative competences our students bring with them, and I love the it, when Kumaravadivalu talks about we have to engage with the existing heuristics of our students. Let's let's take how our students think no matter where they come from, as a basic material for education. So, so what are we going to do with this? Right, the so labeled, and I, I, I'm sorry, I've got to keep occasionally saying so labeled, so labeled. We, we've got to say, we can't, we can't get away with acronyms. Acronyms freeze the discourse. 
we've got to do the work of reminding ourselves all the time that these are labels. So, for so labeled international student from outside the West, wherever that is, the blocks are that they have been fed the Orientalist grand narrative through their own education of how they are inferior to the West. One of my PhD students has written about this recently and about students who come to Britain and they have to get rid of this awful deficiency image that they've been taught throughout their education that the West is superior. My culture is collectivist, we lack self, we, we, we've heard this. And, you know, but there's a lack, you know, where I come from, there's a lack of training, planning. So I've come here to find out how it works. Absolute rubbish. We need to go to the West to learn how things should be done. I'm putting it in red, because this is the block. This is, this is what we have to delete. There are institutional factors. There are issues with resources in different countries. You know, um, not everywhere has beautiful um, furniture like this, which is extremely expensive and, and funded by student fees. And not everybody has lots of technology that often doesn't work. And, you know, circumstances are different. They do vary. It's very nice to go to universities in Germany and Italy and all the furniture is wooden. And you only get one of these if you actually order it, but it works. <laughs> and you know, it's one, and the students don't pay fees, so fantastic. The threads, but the threads often have to be really worked at. And I think this is the value, this is what we as teachers, we have to help our students to find the threads and get around the blocks. I'm running out of time. Um, hmm? I'm okay. So, what do they bring? Excellent personal, family, and education resources. In many cases, they bring with them a huge post colonial criticality, a worldliness of intercultural travel, which our British students often don't have. Strategic essentialism. You know, this business is saying, in my culture, we don't think critically. Um, Trevor Grimshaw wrote something about how Chinese students say this in order to get personal space. Unfortunately, their tutors believe it. This is strategic essentialism. You know, this is when you have to, you have to use a reduced definition of yourself in order to survive in a particular state of oppression. And uh, Daniels and Johnson bring this out in, a, in an interview with Gayatri Spivak. Um, yeah, so there is some agency going on. You gotta find out what's going on when somebody says, in my culture, we don't. There's something going on. There's also the resistance for being labeled. I mean, interesting, when I, when I wrote this article um, in 2017 about, about uh, PhD students who were both British and from all over the world, one of the things that I found, the students refused to be labeled. I wasn't able to refer to them by their nationality because they wouldn't let me. There is a, a, a very particular sort of resistance and, and, and Kiani writes about this, that in the, in the post-colonial, in the, the decolonized state, we can get rid of all these stupid labels that try to separate us one from the other. Okay, and so quite a few PhD theses recently talking about international students working out how to manage all of these different things. And the term hybrid integration comes from the projects I've been working on in Italy to do with children with mig migration background. Hybrid inter integration is where you can become part of something while maintaining everything you bring with you in your own terms. Okay. The British students, interestingly, blocks this awful neoliberal technologized discourse stuff about positivist writing. Academics, their teachers playing safe. 
not encouraging them to do creative, um, critical things. Um, this huge rumor about how you should write, you, you shouldn't be creative and, and critical in your writing. So there's an apparent lack of criticality and self-direction and so on. Fortunately, there are threads. So many of my colleagues working with British students are screaming for their students to be more agented, more critical in their writing. Um, I don't know, uh, a colleague of mine in health was complaining bitterly about students who write, who write dissertations for their, or write assignments at master's level. Why aren't they critical? Why don't they express their, their voice in what they're writing? Every single viva I go into at PhD level, across all subjects, examiners are asking for more voice, more explanation, more criticality. Okay. Also, we have a very sophisticated and developed understanding of the politics of labels when it comes to disability, autism, non-traditional. Why can't we apply this to the intercultural? Why can't we see culture as equally problematic as race or gender? Very, very important to think in those terms. EAP lectures, now I've got to be very careful here. So the blocks, the blocks are not questioning essentialist statements about culture and simplistic descriptions of my context. It's deeply patronizing if you allow your students to write overgeneralized statements about where they come from and you don't challenge them. That implies you think they're all the same and therefore they all have the same brain and therefore they know. If the British student did that, we would challenge them immediately. So this deeply embedded nature of the essentialist paradigm, intercultural training, something that we have to somehow measure and, and develop. And, you know, it's very teachable. We're easily seduced into teaching things that we can measure and segment. And of course, we all love to think of the learner, which I think is, a, is rather an unpleasant neoliberal term it's a sort of medium for education rather than being a full full person but we like to help our learners to be something that they're not and we, it's nice to easily label our learners into different types so these these are these these are the blocks and of course those of us who are in english language teaching have inherited this high control scrutiny of the communicative classroom where every single move and word is watched and remarked on by the teacher, where there's hardly any space for students to be themselves. The threads, we have knowledge of how language and discourse operates. This is what we know as applied linguists. As EAP teachers, we have this wonderful insider-outsider relationship with the institution. So that we're not part of the academic department, but we sort of are, and we can go in and out, and we can see how things operate. We can watch the academic cultures. We can accompany our students in ethnographic exploration. Okay. The importance of always challenging. This comes from an article I wrote with Sarah Medassi. In my culture, there isn't. Are you really sure about that? Oh, actually, no. If you didn't challenge, the narrative would, the essentialist narrative would, would, would continue. You have to challenge. Treating statements about culture as we would statements about race or gender, not allowing stereotypes under any circumstances. Would anybody here allow a stereotype of gender or race in their classroom? So it's the same with culture. Shaking the blocks very quickly brings out the deeper self, the deeper critical self. It doesn't take much to unhinge this essentialist statement about my culture. Okay, 
getting to the bottom of why students feel so unbelieved that they have to resort to these essentialist statements about who they are. What is going on here? This has a lot to do with power, but I really don't understand why it is that students have to diminish themselves with these statements. I think there's a lot of research to be done there. Okay, I didn't know I could do that. I won't be allowed to use creative nonfiction. You will if you explain it properly. But I won't be allowed, you see? I've got far too much data questionnaire. So just choose three or four key examples and write about how they resonate. Can I really do? This was a conversation I had with a colleague with undergraduate British students who were writing their, who were writing their, their dissertations. We were trying to encourage them to be more creative in their writing. Can I really do that? Thematic analysis is a striving which it doesn't work for me. So develop your own version. Is that allowed? You see how we somehow in our institutions are responsible for students feeling that they can't, that something is different, they can't be themselves. And then some nice uh, pieces of research there, Nasima Yam, she talks about Emirati women students um, who tell her in interviews that they hide their criticality in the writing class in order to get good grades. That's really been critical. Okay. And Kuwaiti students who never seem to engage with English in the classroom in their private personal lives use English all the time as a status thing and they're very creative and so on. And then Kanagaraja famously writes about, about all sorts of different students and here American, African American students who, who do much better in their personal blogs than they do in their writing tasks in the classroom. For some reason, there are structures that are getting in the way. So the decolonization agenda, imposition of positivism everywhere. We have to get rid of the idea of the independent individualist research versus a collectivist irrational subject. Encouraging all students to search for new, in fact, old forms of academic rigor, like fine arts and music. Um, Suris Kanagaraja once stood up in one of our conferences in Canterbury and someone asked him, can I publish anything in TESOL Quarterly? He was the editor at the time. He said, yes, as long as you do it well. So, negotiation. So, authorial voice. I have to rush here a little bit. Um, this is a sort of image of part of a piece of academic writing. You've got your your things that you're writing about, you know, transcripts, statistics, descriptions, diary entries, including your research questions. And they're there. What seems to be a problem, and I've noticed this with British students and international students, is that nobody seems to really know how to write about these things using a powerful personal voice. So the decolonizing liberation from positivism requires more nuanced writing about the intersubjectivity of the researcher. Everybody finds this difficult. Personal writing that's closely linked with evidence. Strategic use of the first person or the equivalent, it doesn't have to be the first person. Showing the workings of the development of the argument connecting, pointing. I mean, fascinating. The undergraduate students I, I was working with recently had very, very similar issues to international PhD students and British PhD students in not being able to bring out their personal voice to talk about things. And this means that they didn't create the spaces to connect with who they are as people, to connect with the innate, linguistic and cultural competence that they bring with them. Okay, so this is, this, is, this is the end. What we have, the red is the block, the green is the, is the, this is a diagram I've been using for a long time, but I write different things into it. The established world on the left is the dominant center discourses and narratives. And this is fed 
by our imagination of the world, our definition of the margins that make us feel better because we can help. International students come from collectivist cultures and we need to help them to blah, 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 blah. Okay, very, very powerful. In the middle, we have a, an imagined marginal world, which I think some people will call falsely conscious, where somehow the people who are not in the West think that resisting is by adopting the stereotypes created by the West. So this is very dangerous. So we international students have cultures that do not allow us to write critically. We resist Western modes of thinking and writing because our cultures are relational. But actually not writing critically and relational is a Western stereotype. So this is not really getting anywhere. What we have to get to is the right hand side, all of us have to get there and we have to help our students to get there and they have to help us to get there. The real world of the margins, the private secret sites that Kamen Garaja talks about, found with great difficulty, we claim ownership of what has been attributed, has been attributed to the West and can do it better. We possess a creative cultural hybridity that contests the individualist collectivist separation of the researcher from the researched. We can do all of this, but we can do it better. Okay. Because we're not trying to educate the world. And then that's the very final part. Ibn Khaldun and Cafe Nadiri. Why is it? But in a lecture similar to this, I mentioned that when I did my undergraduate sociology course, the first sociologist's name that appeared on the blackboard was Ibn Khaldun, a North African sociologist. And he was said to me as the father of sociology. I got emails afterwards from, from students from the Arab world and North Africa saying, at last somebody has mentioned somebody from our history. Café Nadari is a café in Tehran, which has been there since the 1930s, where intellectuals, artists and poets used to go. And I showed a photograph of it in another session. And there was one Iranian student amongst a whole load of other international ones. He said, at last, somebody can understand where I come from. So important. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to stop.